Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Ms. Christina Satyamala, representative from the Embassy of India, Ms. Satyamala's sister. I declare the meeting open. I bid you, Ms. Christina Satyamala, most heartily welcome. You may now give a brief exposition of your research, of your reasons for having undertaken it, and of the results it has yielded. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. Rector Magnificus, members of the Plenary Doctoral Committee, dear colleagues, friends, and family. This afternoon, I'm defending my dissertation entitled, Nutrition Contested Meanings, a Theoretical and Empirical Inquiry. But before I begin, a few words on how I arrived at my research question. Initially, I had in mind a much narrower question for study. Having observed laboring adults become visibly thin while working in the government's workfare program, I was interested in exploring the impact of such interventions on the health and well-being. However, in the first months of my work, a paper by two eminent economists was published in one of the prestigious journals in India. The paper discussed plausible explanations from a, uh, to a set of puzzles that has marked the nutritional status in India. I wrote a response from a public health point of view, addressing some of the fallacies and contradictions in the argument, but the journal refused to publish it. I found the explanation by the editor for the rejection less than satisfactory and a clear demonstration of the power of epistemic authority to silence counter-narratives to dominant truth discourses. I had found my research question and a framework. In this presentation, I shall outline the puzzle, the central question, the theoretical approach, methodology, key findings, and conclusions. The nu Indian nutritional scenario is full of paradoxes. One third, of the, one third to half the children under the age of five and one third of the adult population in the country are underweight. The surprising thing is that these levels have persisted despite increasing national incomes. Even more surprising is that these levels are higher than that found in most sub-Saharan African countries which are much poorer than India. This phenomenon has been varyingly termed the Asian enigma and a development paradox. Adding to the complexity is a fall in cereal consumption even among the poorest segment of the population. Yet another side to the story is the alleged emergence of obesity as a public health problem. India is said to be under the dual burden of undernutrition and obesity. Several theories have been put forward to explain the paradox. One school of thought seeks to find explanations within the new liberal paradigm. Explanations have varied from reduced need for food due to mechanization sedentary lifestyles, improved epidemiological environment. The small but healthy hypothesis and a variation of this, that international standards or measurements are too high for Indians is the other explanation. Another school of thought seeks to question the neoliberal paradigm and argues that the fall in food consumption and the consequent undernutrition is due to increasing impoverishment, inequality, increasing food prices and food budget squeeze. Yet another group, that represents a medical establishment, argues from a narrow biomedical framework based on risk factor epidemiology. 
Much of it is victim blaming, lack of education, care, lack of knowledge about nutrition, hygiene and sanitation. And inadequate health service is also seen as a risk factor. It is in the context of these discourses I pose my research questions. My study is at two levels, epistemological, a critique of the politics of knowledge production on nutrition, and empirical, which following from the critique is to develop a perspective in the context of the everyday life of the poor laboring households. I therefore ask two questions. What are the epistemological and ideological foundations of the science of nutrition since its evolution in the 19th century? This forms the context for asking the central question of the research, why is there a persistence of the problem of nutrition in India? My work is a dialogue intersecting between the social sciences, epidemiology and public health and is set out in two parts, social production of knowledge and social production of disease. I use the Foucauldian genealogy as the theoretical approach to explore the epistemological question as it is better suited than the Kuhnian paradigm which ignores the social context in which knowledge is produced. Using the concepts of descent, that is a history of the past, and emergence, that is a history of the present, I analyze archival materials, both primary and secondary, from the early 1800s till the contemporary period. These have been presented in three chapters. The first of these, Nutrition as a Social Problem, 1800s to early 1900s, describes how food was cast as nutrition with the emergence of chemistry as an independent discipline and the differing trajectories the scientific discourse took in Europe, Britain and the US due to the particular socio-economic, socio-political context and why some became dominant and others marginalized. The next chapter from early 1900s to 1940s, the interwar years, when nutrition was cast as a public health problem in the, stock, in the context of the stock market collapse in the 1930s with its attendant unemployment and consequent fall in food consumption. Nutrition science was assimilated into modern medicine as a part of its scientification. An ideological shift occurred and the popular notion that poverty led to hunger was replaced by the notion that wrong eating led to malnutrition. The last chapter in this section extends from 1940s to contemporary period. This period saw the institutionalization of epistemic authority at the international level, with leadership loyal to the Western powers and universalizing notions of science. To justify undernourished bodies that could not be invisibilized, a small but healthy hypothesis was put forward and bare survival requirements formed the basis for calculating minimum wages. Thus. From the time when food was deconstructed into its chemical components, the science of nutrition has been a contested territory. At every point there have been competing discourses and the one that took precedence did so, not because it was superior, but due to patronage from dominant forces creating truth claims favorable for capital accumulation. Depending upon the biopolitical objectives of the nation states, the social political location of bodies determined their importance to the economy and were differentially nourished in the Foucauldian sense of making live and letting die. To explore the second question of social production of disease, I use the framework eco-social theory, which views diseases and well-being as biological expressions of social relations and asks who or what is responsible for the pattern of undernutrition in the present, past and changing inequalities. The framework was expanded to include explicit political economy, political ecology, and psychosocial perspectives. The study was located in a village in the Tinal Valley district of Tamil Nadu, a state in India with allegedly good governance and enabling social policies. The fieldwork was an intense 15 months duration to cover the entire agricultural cycle. The study looked at state inter interventions, specifically the feeding programs for children, the public distribution of essential food commodities, and the work program of the National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme in the context of the everyday lives of the people. Being an ethnograph study, the participant observation formed the central method of data collection. The challenge was, even while observing, how not to become the eye of surveillance. Field notes, more than 1,100 pages were written. Quantitative data, qualitative data, in-depth interviews, and secondary data from official registers were collected with each source forming one piece to complete the picture. Some of the key findings. The empirical data showed a high prevalence of undernutrition across age, caste, class, and gender. 
The pattern was complex and with no clear unidirectional association reflecting cohort-specific effects. More adults were undernourished than children under the ages of six years, and prevalence of obesity was marginal. The state interventions were important, but contradictory. <coughs> Child feeding programs, although important in reducing prevalence and severity of undernutrition, did not cover the calorie gap for all children. The public, dis public distribution of commodities formed an important safety net, but led to food transition, which was in some ways worse than the past. The workfare programs was important in increasing cash flow, but because of the working conditions, had the potential for <coughs> increasing undernutrition among the workers, who were almost all women. The everyday diet was insufficient in quantity and quality. While the presence of a good network of health services reduced mortality, the high cost of unregulated private sector was a debt trap and therefore a poverty trap. A surprising finding was that while the deaths in childhood had decreased phenomenally, the death rates in adults during that reproductive, during the productive period of life was high. These were due to suicide, violence, vehicular, occupational, alcohol associated, leading to instability and insecurity of households. The findings of this study demonstrated that the neoliberal explanations that have been put forward to explain the Indian paradox are untenable. It is said that there is less calorie requirement because of better epidemiological environment. However, the reality, the, the reality is that the epidemiological environment continues to be poor and in fact worse in some ways. It is said that there is less calorie requirement because of mechanization. How the reality is that except for some selected tasks and housework, in agriculture and housework, the others still require labor which expend high energy. The neoliberal explanation is that there is less calorie requirement because of sedentarization. However, this study showed that sedentary workers were as undernourished as those involved in heavy work in agriculture. It is said that, it is said that standards and measurements are inappropriate. How this study showed that it is appropriate for comparing populations and BMI and height and weight each have their own place in assessing nutrition. Based on the empirical data to answer the question why there is undernutrition, child care is not a priority in the context of survival needs of the poor household. State interventions have been formulated on decontextualized biomedical model. State interventions provide selective care in the manner of making live and letting die. Combining, this, the, combining these two questions, so the epistemological question and the empirical finding, I conclude, nutrition theories have shown an unchanging discourse from the time food was cast as nutrition. The undernutrition continues to be a consequence of depleting bodies whose labor subsidizes capital and market. Finally, moving forward, the broad recommendations from this study are Care of the specific subgroups of population needs to be expanded by care of all the individuals in the household and social groups with due recognition to equalities, inequalities within and outside. State interventions need to be life-affirming rather than life-annihilating. Only when all bodies assume equal importance in the biopolitics of a nation state will it be possible for all people to attain a healthy biomass. Thank you. And none. Thank you very much.